Hey everybody, welcome to Altium Academy. I am your host, Zach Peterson, and today we are gonna be talking about Via in Pad. Now, in the past, we have gotten some questions about when to use Via in Pad, specifically around fanning out a BGA that has very fine pitch, such as like less than one millimeter all the way down to half millimeter pitch. So that's the topic that we're gonna look at today. And it's something where you really have to balance your design needs with manufacturing capabilities. So it's a great example of when to understand some DFM rules. All right, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. All right, everybody, so on this topic of via in pad, we need to look at a few things. First, what is via in pad and how do you construct vias for use in via in pad? And then we can look at when you should use it. And then third, how to use it in a fan out specifically for a fine pitch BGA. So those are the three topics we're gonna cover. All right, so first, what is via in pad? So let's just take a look at our nice familiar side view of a PCB. And let's just suppose we've got a drilled hole here and it's all plated up and it's going to be used as a via. So we've got our via plating here, we've got our landing pad, and then maybe there's a trace that connects up here on the top layer. Now, normally in this situation where you're routing into this via from a component, maybe your component package is over here, the lead on your component package is going to solder onto some landing pad here that you define in the PCB footprint. So you've got all this copper and you've got a little bit of distance between the edge of the component, so these are your component leads, and then the via. Via in pad essentially just means that you are actually going to be soldering the component directly onto this via. So the via and the pad are essentially one and the same. So instead of having the component body up here like this, you may put the component, let's say, right here. And then the lead on the component may be, let's say, right here. So this isn't the best drawing, but you kind of get the idea. You would essentially be soldering in this area or possibly in this area over here. And there's gonna be a via barrel very close to the region where you're soldering. And that is essentially via in pad. You literally have a via in the mounting pad where you're going to solder a surface mounted component. Okay, so I've redrawn this really quick just to illustrate something. So let's just suppose that my component body is like this and I've got my other pad back here on this side and we're gonna be soldering right here and then we're gonna be soldering right here. Well, what should be the obvious danger with this via? Well, if we're doing via in pad and there is literally a via in the pad where I'm soldering, there is of course a risk that some of this solder ends up flowing through the via and then ends up somewhere here on the back of the board during assembly. Now that's generally a bad thing. The reason that's a bad thing is because if there's some other components on this other side of the board, there's a risk that that solder will then solidify over on this other side of the board and then create a bridge between those components and maybe this net. So you then create a short circuit. So generally a bad thing. Now, one way that you would normally prevent this with a via placed anywhere else on the board during like reflow soldering is to then tent those vias. So when a via is tented, it's covered over with solder mask. And when it's covered over with solder mask, you're not gonna have a situation where any of that solder can then flow through and then reach the other side and possibly create a short circuit. With via and pad, we don't really have that luxury. We can't just throw solder mask over here because we need to actually solder here. What do we do in the case where we have via in pad and we need to prevent that solder defect? Well, normally what is done is this is filled and then capped off. So when I say filled, what they will do is they will take this via and they will fill it in with some material. They'll fill it in with an epoxy. And then they will plate it over and that plating will essentially cap this off so it holds all of this epoxy in the interior of the via. So you have some cap plating here, you have some cap plating here, and then you have a fill material in here. So this fill material can be a conductive epoxy or it can be a non-conductive epoxy. Now, which one you should use 
really depends on the level of reliability that you need and whether or not this is gonna be cycled frequently. Because if this board is cycled frequently during operation, meaning thermally cycled, so it reaches high and low temperatures, this epoxy will expand and different epoxies will expand at different rates. So if the expansion is too extreme inside of this via barrel, it could actually break the cap plating and then you have a via failure. And that's something that you absolutely don't want if you have a product that needs to be highly reliable under repeated thermal cycles. Now, generally your manufacturer or your fabrication house can give you some advice as to when you should use this if you ask them nicely. So if you're unsure of which uh, type of epoxy to use, if you do need to use via in-pad, you should consult with them. They can usually give you some advice as far as the specific materials that they will be using to then fill and cap your vias. Now, there will be an extra charge for this if you take this board and you put it into manufacturing. That extra charge is not gonna be very extreme uh, depending on how many you're gonna produce and how many vias you have to fill, but just make sure that you're aware of that because they don't do this kind of thing for free. But they will give you the advice on which material to use if you ask them nicely. Okay, so the next question is, when should you use via in pad? Should you always use via in pad? Well, there are some reasons to use it. So first, if you're just doing kind of a basic board, you don't have a really high density of components, then generally you're not gonna need via in pad. The reason that you may want to avoid via in pad is number one, of course, the reliability issue that I mentioned. There is that question of reliability and you should figure that out if you do decide to use via in pad. But then of course, there is the cost involved that I mentioned. The cost becomes problematic as you start to scale to more and more units. So maybe if you're producing a prototype, the cost is not gonna be so extreme. However, as you then scale up to more units that you're producing, that cost does not scale off or fall off at the same rate as your board fab costs just for the bare boards. So those costs scale differently, and because of that, the scaling for the total price per unit that you're gonna pay per bare board is going to be different with the via in pad versus without the via in pad. So when should you use via in pad? Well, let's just suppose we have Another component, we need to mount it here. And normally if you had uh, enough room on your board, you could space these things out enough to where you could just run a small trace into this via. So these two components might share this via and then you could run a small trace, they'll connect to the via and you don't necessarily need via in pad. However, as your component density starts to increase and you get your components closer and closer together, then what happens is you might be forced to put components onto these same pieces of copper. And then as a result, you then need to have via in pad on one or more of these components. So really the big driver for doing this is to make more room for components up on the top or bottom layers of the PCB. So one of the major drivers to use via in pad is when you have a fine pitch BGA. Now, there are a number of reasons that you might need to shift from something like a dog bone fan out to via in pad. So one of those would be, what drill size do you have to use? Or does your fabricator have to use rather? What pad size has to correspond to that to ensure you have enough annular ring? So we've talked about this in a previous video, and this is specifically gonna relate to whether or not you need IPC class two or class three certification for your design. Then the other reason is, of course, the pitch between balls in the BGA. As that pitch gets finer, you're then gonna have to make that pad size smaller, and eventually you're gonna have to move it off of a dog bone fan out into a via in pad. So let's take a look at an example. Okay, so I wanna show an example of a component here that I found on Octopart. Now this particular component is a DAC, so it's a digital to analog converter. It's not a huge ball count component. So you can see here from the image from Newark, it is a BGA. However, if you just go over here to the data sheet and you look here on uh, this first page, you'll actually see here that even for this kind of component, which I don't think we would consider a super advanced component, we do have pretty fine pitch, right? 0.8 millimeter pitch. There are other examples you can find out there where the component, again, isn't a super advanced component, but because they're targeting something that requires a really small footprint, they actually use a, a BGA package that does have really fine pitch. So the smallest BGA pitch that I've ever worked with is actually a TI audio processor component, 
and it's not even like a hundred ball BGA or anything like that. I think it only has like 30 pins, but it was a 0.4 millimeter pitch. That's actually the finest pitch BGA I've ever worked with. So that just kind of gives you an example of the different components that can have these really fine pitches and might require via in pad. If we scroll down here, this data sheet is pretty long, but if we scroll through here and we eventually look at the ball out, you'll be able to see what the ball pitch is, what the ball size is, and then they may even give you an example land pattern. We did a previous example where we looked at what the uh, land size needs to be for uh, different ball pitches. And we're gonna go ahead and link to that video in the description, but that will give you some insight as far as how large you need to make the landing pads for this BGA footprint in order to ensure manufacturability and assembly. Okay, so let's continue with that component for a moment. So in our example, we had this component where we have a nominal ball diameter of 0.4 millimeters. And that's going to require a land size of about 0.3 millimeters. So we'll actually make this the land size. So this is our land and then our ball size was 0.4 millimeters. So if we reconvert this to mills, I'm gonna work in mills just cause you know, I'm in the US, I'm a little more familiar with it and doing it off the top of my head. Here, if we convert all of this, then this is gonna be about 12 mils diameter, and this is for our land. And then we had a spacing between balls in this component of 0.8 millimeters or about 32 mils. So in this design problem, as far as creating the footprint and determining where we need to then put our uh, vias in order to do a fan out, how big can we make those vias? How big of a drill can we have? And then do we ever need to go to via in pad with this particular component? So that's what we're gonna look at in this example. If I have a land size of let's say 12 mils, that means my pad here is essentially 12 mils that I need to solder onto. I need to have a solderable area of 12 mils. However, when I actually fabricate this, that pad size can be larger. So I can make that pad size larger so that I'm able to say hit class two compliance or class three compliance. However, I can then cover that with solder mask and then I have a solder mask defined pad. So let's say I make a solder mask defined pad with a 12 mil opening, but if I have a, let's say 18 mil diameter pad that's underneath that solder mask, what's my clearance here between neighboring pads? Well, this is 32. That means this distance right here is nine mils. That means this distance right here is also gonna be nine mils to the next neighboring pad. And how much spacing does that leave me? Well, here, this is 18. So that leaves about 14 mil spacing right here. So that leaves 14 mil between pads. So this is a pretty comfortable clearance that most fabricators are not gonna have a problem with even if they're doing BGAs. And this is actually a pretty big covering in terms of the solder mask opening that you have here. So this is a six mil reduction around the edge of this pad. So that's actually pretty big. Now, if we wanted to do class two compliance for this, we would have an 18 mil pad with a 10 mil drill. So we drill a 10 mil hole, we'd have an 18 mil pad, there'd be 14 mil clearance between pads. For this type of situation, where even at a 0.8 millimeter ball pitch, you're still gonna be able to use reasonably large drill sizes, reasonably large pad sizes, and you could do via in pad with this arrangement, and you'd still have plenty of clearance between pads. This is just one example of how to do that design. Now, what you could also do to figure out if you could do a dog bone fan out is you could actually look at the diagonal spacing between pads, and then you could try and fit one of these pads in between those two uh, balls diagonally. And the reason you would do that is so that you can ensure you can fit that entire pad there and then route a trace in for a dog bone fan out. So that would be the other way to do this type of component. Usually when I'm at like 0.8 millimeters and smaller, then I'm gonna consider via in pad, primarily because I can still use a 10 mil mechanical drill and I can still hit class two compliance at least without violating any clearances. Now with this, if this were gonna be class three, I would wanna take this and go up to say 20 mils for this pad size here that is uh, beneath the solder mask. So going up to 20 mils, we now have an extra mil here. So this is 10 and then this is also gonna be 10. 
And then that is going to leave me 32 minus 10 minus 10, 12 mil between these pads. So again, we're still pretty comfortable in terms of what most fabricators can handle for clearances. This is another situation where via in pad, you can do it, you might not have to do it. It just depends on how big drill you're gonna use. And then it's also gonna depend on what pad size you need and then the pitch between the component. Before you actually finalize this, I do recommend Go talk to a fabrication house, make sure that this is something that the fabricator you want to use can actually fabricate before you finalize this. Because otherwise, if you do the design first and then it turns out that you're gonna violate their clearance capabilities, what they're gonna do is they're gonna come back and tell you, hey, you need to change this footprint. That can usually mean that you're gonna have to change all the routing in that uh, component. And let's say it's 169 ball BGA like we just saw on the screen. That's a lot of traces that you have to reroute. So do your homework on the front end, figure this out first, and you'll save yourself some headache later. All right, thanks everybody for sitting through this. Definitely on this kind of stuff, you gotta call your fabricator because otherwise you might violate some clearances. Make sure to leave your questions and comments in the comments section. Hit that subscribe button, hit the like button. And of course, send all your Q&A stuff over to YouTube at allteam.com. We love getting your questions and we hope to get more questions from you about this kind of stuff soon. All right, thanks everybody. Yeah.